It wasn't a simple case, but then again, they never are. I'm a man with a certain level of expertise, something that makes me quite useful to a certain part of the populace. My name is Pony Josiah 13. I'm a mystery writer. The case today, how does one exactly write a mystery story? That was a baffling question, one that I wasn't quite ready to answer without a little help. The first thing I needed to do, I needed to look up some old friends of mine, a group of six pals that always travel together. These pals of mine have a gimmick. You answer their questions, and they can take you places, anywhere you want to go. Even if it's outside the boundaries of time and space, or even possibility, they can take you there. You just have to answer those six questions, but answering those questions, that's not always easy. But if I was going to solve this case, I'd have to start somewhere, and sometimes you have to start with the very basics. Those of us who passed elementary school English will know the six questions. Who, what, where, when, how, and why. Every writer knows that answering those six questions is essential to creating a story. But in a mystery story, each of those six questions comes with some additional considerations that you'll have to answer before you even start writing. Let's start with the most simple question. What? Specifically, what is the crime? What is the central plot of your story? You'll have to start here because it's the least specific question and it's the baseline for everything else. I'll give you a word of advice here that will bear on everything else in this workshop. Start simple. A tale full of twists and turns of conspiracies and cover-ups and hidden motives where a bunch of subplots all turn out to be connected to one another is compelling, sure, and fun to think about. But the more complicated something is, the more likely that the details aren't going to gel together. If you start out with a massively overcomplicated plot, you end up making more work for yourself by having to tear stuff down and repair it. If you start out simple, you can start from the ground up and then build on it, which is much easier. The next question you'll want to turn to is who. Who are your characters? You'll want to start with the three most important characters in the story. First of all, your victim. Let's say in this example she's a young and upcoming aspiring movie actress who is tragically murdered. Rich, ditzy, bit of a socialite, kind of a dilettante, might have had a couple lovers on the side. That's a good basis for a start. Secondly, who is your perpetrator? The person who actually commits the crime. When brainstorming suspects, you should also brainstorm potential motives they had against the victim. The jilted ex-lover, if a bit cliché, is always a good angle, but you could also add in the upcoming rifle, the creepy stalker with a crush, the attorney who had his eyes on her money, and so on and so forth. That's an entire cast of potential suspects at your fingertips. But you still have to pick which one or which ones actually committed the crime. But once you've picked out which one of them committed it, that becomes probably the most important decision in your story. This is not an exaggeration in the slightest. Every clue, every incident in your story will eventually have to lead up to that person. Thirdly and finally, who is your detective? Your detective is your protagonist, the character that the story spends the most time on, so you'd better have a pretty fleshed out character. But the special considerations that you have to provide for when thinking about a detective are how they get involved in the first place, and their motivations for being a detective. There are plenty of archetypes to pick from in this regard. You've got the young adventurer types like Hardy Boys and Nancy Drew, who just seem to stumble into trouble. The hard-boiled private eyes like Sam Spade and Philip Marlowe. The intellectual private detective like Hercule Poirot or Sherlock Holmes who does it for the challenge. The police detective who's just doing the right thing as part of their duty. And so on and so forth. Whatever your detective is, in the end, is going to influence a lot of how they interact with the other characters and the environment around them. And that motivation is going to be pretty central to their character. Further, that motivation will also influence exactly how they get involved in the case in the first place, be it a case of wrong place in the wrong time, or being hired, or seeking out the adventure. The next two questions will come hand in hand. Where and when was the crime committed? 
Not only will you need to know what your perpetrator was doing at the time, but you also should know or at least have an idea of what all your other suspects were doing when the crime was committed, because you'll need to know that for their alibis. You'll also have to consider the effects of time on the place where the crime was committed. For example, if the crime was committed during the day or at night, if there were other people around, the weather, the lighting, all of these will tie into how the crime was committed and what kind of evidence was left behind. In a broader sense, where and when also refers to the world that the story takes place in. Be it Victorian England, Great Depression New York City, 1950s Berlin, or a moon base in 2739. The technology, the political views, the culture, and societal views will all tie into the crime itself, the characters, and how everything interacts with one another. For example, if your story is set in 1920s Chicago and your protagonist is a young black female, that will tie into how other characters view and interact with them and how they view themselves. Also, if your story is set in 1920s Chicago, it wouldn't make a lot of sense for your character to send a blood sample to the lab for a DNA analysis. The fifth question, why? Why was the crime committed? What was the perpetrator's motive? In truth, you should already have some idea of the perpetrator's motive when you first created the characters and their relationship to one another, specifically the perpetrator's relationship to the victim. Even if they didn't know each other face to face, the victim should still have something that the perpetrator wanted and that they acquired through the crime. However, motive is a bit more complex than simply the reason why a person did something. The motive, as well as how the character decided upon that motive, how they gained the information that led to that decision, their relationship to the victim, all ties into how much planning went into crime, whether it was spur of the moment or premeditated. Let's take the example of a husband killing his wife because she was cheating on him. If he comes home to find her in bed with another man, he might decide to kill her in a fit of rage. If he sees her through the window while he's passing outside, he might go to a bar, have a few drinks, and then kill her in a drunken frenzy. Or if he confronts her about it, and after the fact, she might kick him out and he spends a few months wallowing in humiliation, stewing in his anger, and then decide to kill her in an elaborate revenge scheme. That choice all depends on the husband's character, his relationship to his wife, and how he found out that she was cheating on him. All of which are choices that you should have made before you even started writing. The motive and the level of planning will also tie into the sixth and final question. How? How exactly was the crime committed? We'll talk more about how in the next section, actually planning out the crime. But what you need to know is this. Once you have figured out the answers to the other five questions, you can start working on how, actually planning out the crime, and that's where writing out the story really begins. In conclusion, the six questions, who, what, where, when, how, and why, are the foundation to writing a story. Once you've decided upon a plot, assembled the cast of characters, figured out the setting, and deduced a motive, then you can start writing out your mystery story. And the next step to that is planning out the perfect crime. Or rather, the not-so-perfect crime. The six questions had been a big help as usual. With their assistance, I managed to get a rough outline of where I was going with this case. But it wasn't enough. I needed more than who, what, where, when, how, and why. I needed an actual crime. I needed a crime scene. And I needed clues. For the case to move on, it was time for me to slip into the mind of a criminal. It was time to plan the perfect crime. You can't solve a crime without a crime, and you can't solve a crime without knowing what happened. So before you actually start writing your mystery story, you need to actually plan out the crime in the story. Even if it's never committed on screen, so to speak, you do need to know what happened, how, and why. When you're planning out your crime, there are three things you want to keep in mind right from the start. The first thing, all crimes are a means to an end. 
A criminal commits a crime because there's something that they want and they believe that they can get it by committing a crime. The robber robs stores because he wants money. A jealous husband beats his wife to keep her under control. The wife kills him in self-defense and so on. Bottom line, the criminal commits the crime because they believe it is the fastest, easiest way to get what they want. If they had an alternate way to get what they want, they would likely pick that. The second thing, like most people, criminals will choose the easiest, most direct path. No reasonable person would want to go through a 12-step procedure if they can get what they want in five. The more complicated a plot or a plan, the more work that is for both the criminal and for you, and the more confusing it's going to be for a reader. Keep it simple and short. Don't overthink it, and don't add unnecessary details. The third thing. Like most people, criminals are creatures of habit. If they can try something one way and it works, they'll usually try it in the same or similar manner. For example, if a burglar successfully breaks into a home in a certain neighborhood at around 2 in the afternoon, the odds are they will try to break into a home in the same neighborhood at around the same time. Or if a con artist tries a scam on a certain person and it pays off, they'll likely try a similar scam on a similar target in the future. In other words, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. If your perpetrator knows that there's a certain way to do something, for example, get into someone's house, that actually works, the likelihood is they'll try it that way then try something that may or may not work. Keeping all three of these things in mind, you will have to plan out the crime in totality before you write it down. What you're thinking about primarily is your criminal's modus operandi. Modus operandi is Latin for mode of operation and refers to how a criminal commits a crime. The details that go into modus operandi are very numerous, but here are a few questions you'll want to generally think about. How did the perpetrator get into the crime scene? How did they get out? What tools did they bring? How did they acquire them? Did they pick up anything that they used during the crime? For example, a fireplace poker that they used to strike an attacker? How familiar are they with the area of the crime scene? How did they know where to go? Did they counter any obstacles? If so, how did they surmount them? Did they counter any unexpected developments? If so, how did they deal with them? Was there any violence involved? Who was struck and why? And after their escape, did they take any steps to ensure that they wouldn't be caught, for example, disposing evidence? The answers to these questions will be based on the answers to the first questions that you gave at the start of the story. Consider the perpetrator's motive, the level of planning that went into it, the intellect, their ability to access the necessary materials, their relationship with the victim, their relationship with the scene of the crime, etc, etc. And remember the three things that I mentioned earlier in this episode. Your perpetrator's character and motive will tell you how they commit the crime. Once you've planned the crime out in its entirety, then you'll have to start asking yourself what kind of clues the criminal left behind so that your detective will use to solve the crime. The key to this part is the keystone of forensic science, Edmund Locard's exchange principle. Every contact leaves a trace and takes a trace with it. Basically, every time you touch or come into contact with something, you leave behind a little part of yourself and you take a little part of whatever you touched with you. To make a rather obvious example, let's say you're walking down the street minding your business and you step in a puddle of red paint. After that, you'll be leaving a trail of red footprints behind you, and your shoe will have red paint on it. Even if you try to wash your shoe off, traces of the paint will likely remain behind. This is how your detective will find your perpetrator, by what they left behind and what they took with them. Consider everything and everyone that your criminal interacted with during the commission of their crime as opportunities to both leave behind and take evidence. For example, if they walk through a muddy field, not only will they have left behind footprints, they'll have soil traces in their shoes. If they climb through a broken window, they might snag their clothes on the glass shards and leave behind some fibers, or even cut themselves, and they might get shards of the glass in their clothes. If they took a smoke while waiting for their target to appear, they might have left behind ash or cigarette butts. If they struggled with their victim, the victim might have gotten some of their hair or skin or blood on them, and so on. Fingerprints, footprints, clothing, tool marks, bullet cartridges, injuries, blood, hair, sweat, skin, soil samples, everything that a criminal might have taken with them or might have left behind can be used to trace them back to the crime. Of course, when thinking about the evidence, you'll have to consider the level of technology in your world. For example, if your story is set in Victorian England, your character might not be searching for fingerprints, and they certainly wouldn't be sending a blood sample to the lab for a DNA test. Bottom line, after you know how your criminal committed the crime, what you'll want to ask yourself is, what did they take with them, and what did they leave behind? On a final note, once you've considered everything else, one thing you might want to consider adding to your story is a criminal's signature. 
A signature is not part of a criminal's modus operandi because it's not something that's necessarily relevant to the crime itself. However, if the crime is committed out of a psychological or emotional need, a criminal may perform a signature to satisfy that need. Essentially, a signature is a personal touch added to a crime that's not necessary for the commission of the crime itself, but is necessary for the perpetrator for whatever reason. Signatures can be a wide variety of things, for example, messages or symbols left behind at a crime scene, like the Zodiac Killer's sign. They can be marks or certain words left on the victim, for example, a jealous husband might write slut on his wife's forehead after killing her. The signature can even be the certain type of victim. For example, serial killer Ted Bundy preferred brunettes with their hair parted in a certain way. The possibilities for the signatures and what they might be are pretty much endless, but like everything else in your story, they have to connect back to your perpetrator and why they committed the crime. They will also usually be among the more significant clues in your story, because it is the most personal to the crime itself. In conclusion, after you've set up the basis for the story, the next step will be determining how the crime is actually committed, and then using that as a platform to determine what clues the perpetrator left behind. By now you will have the answers to all six questions, who, what, where, when, why, and how. The next step in your story will be determining how to reveal those answers to the detective, and by extension to your reader. If there's one thing I've learned in life, it's that nothing's going to come to you. You want to get somewhere, you gotta go somewhere. In this case, that somewhere where I wanted to go was just as being served in my suspect in jail. And maybe get a drink along the way. But how was I going to get there? It'd be just like following a map. A map that was in little pieces that I had to pick up one at a time and follow one step at a time. A map that might not be completely accurate all the time. A map that might lead me down a wrong turn from time to time. But it was the only map I had, and if I was going to find enough pieces to get the full picture, I'd have to follow it step by step. No one said this job would be easy. If it was, everyone would be doing it. It's time for the most important part of this case. It's time for the investigation. As the writer of the mystery story, you should already have the answers to all of the questions before you start writing the story. The problem then becomes, how do you have your detective find the answers to those questions in a logical manner? The key to this part is to think like a detective. You'll have to start at the very beginning, the crime scene. When your detective first arrives at the crime scene, you'll have to think about what information is immediately available to them and what questions they'll be asking based on that evidence. For example, let's say the detective is called to a scene where a body is pulled up from a river. They'll be asking the obvious questions right from the bat. Who is the victim? How did they die? When did they get into the river? When and where did they die? Who killed them? Etc. Etc. You will already have the answers to those questions, and you'll reveal the answers gradually by using evidence from the scene. For example, there might be footprints from the killer dragging the victim into the river. The victim may be partially decomposed depending on how long they've been in the river, and there might be marks on them that may or may not be immediately apparent. All that adds up to information that will be useful in the investigation. For example, the detective might deduce that the killer was wearing a certain brand of boots, size 9, and that the victim had been dead for about three weeks and was killed by a gunshot to the head. If and when the victim is later identified through an autopsy, the detective can then check their relatives and acquaintances for anyone with a size 9 boot and a matching handgun. Logical chains and jumps like this are how you reveal information to the detective and how the case progresses. Whenever new information is revealed, every decision that the detective makes based on that information should have a logical chain attached to that decision. The chain will go like this, the initial question, the evidence, the deduction, and then the following question. For example, during the initial investigation, the detective will ask how did the victim end up in the river. 
and will find footprints and drag marks in the bank, deduce that the victim was dragged into the river by someone, possibly the killer, and the new question will become who dragged them into the river. Every time the detective makes a deduction and makes a decision based off of that information, there should be this chain behind it. If there's a gap somewhere in that chain, you've made a mistake and need to go back and fix it. If you don't follow the chain correctly, it can lead to your detective making huge jumps of logic that are sometimes called bat deductions. An example of a bat deduction would be like this. The detective is investigating an apparent suicide, and in the living room they find ash in a cigarette tray that matches the brands that the victim's brother uses. From that, they deduce that the victim's brother was having an affair with the victim's wife, and they teamed up to kill him and make it look like a suicide. A deduction like that is humongous gap in logic and completely illogical, and your readers will call you out on it. Bad deductions are lazy writing that comes from the writer needing to progress the story but not knowing how. In cases like this, it's better to make small steps than humongous leaps. In the given example, a more logical scenario would play out like this. The detective notices the cigarette's ashes and questions the victim's brother, and if their alibi doesn't match up with the facts, then they might have more of a focus on them and find out about the affair that way. The detective will be using the information they get to assemble a pool of suspects. Initially, that will be anyone and everyone who is related to the victim or the scene of the crime somehow. Just like how in Clue, all six guests are suspects, in a crime scene investigation, everyone who is involved with the victim, their family, their relatives, their friends and co-workers, will initially be suspect. On top of that, potential witnesses, even the person who called in the crime or someone who found the body, might be considered suspects. It's not uncommon for criminals in real life to call the police on their own crimes and try to throw police off the track. Keep in mind, an investigation is not and should not be static. As more information is revealed and more people are added to the story, the pool of suspects will likely shrink and grow. And how exactly does one find more information? Crime scene investigation and looking at clothes is only one part. Another part will be questioning suspects and witnesses and finding more information. When you're writing a scene where a detective questions a suspect, you'll want to ask yourself a couple things. Firstly, you need to know the difference between an interview and an interrogation. An interview is a non-confrontational questioning of a suspect or a witness in order to find information. A detective will spend most of an interview simply asking questions and listening to testimony. An interrogation, on the other hand, is a confrontational questioning in which the detective confronts a suspect with evidence against them in order to get a confession or an admission. A detective in an interrogation will be going on the offensive, confronting the suspect with any witnesses against them, confronting their lies, and acting for explanations in order to clear up what happened. An interrogation should only happen in the later stages of an investigation, because one of the keys of a successful interrogation is that the detective should already have all the information available to them, or at least they should make the suspect think that they already know everything. Keep in mind, an interview and interrogation can turn from one into the other, depending on what's revealed or what information becomes available. Secondly, you need to ask yourself a couple of questions. What would the suspect tell the truth about, and what would they lie about? For example, a friend of the victim might be completely honest when she says she didn't do it and she hadn't seen the victim the night she was killed, but if the detective presses her about her potential relationship with the victim's husband, then she might become a little more evasive. The way a detective gets information out of an interrogation or an interview is by confirming facts with other evidence and by searching for discrepancies in the victim's alibi or testimony. Fans of the Ace Attorney video game series will likely be familiar with this kind of thing. Again, since you'll be thinking like a detective during this part, trust but verify is the key term that you should be thinking of. As the writer, you will know if the suspect is telling the truth or not. As the detective, you won't know that, which means you'll have to check their information. For example, a witness might say that they were casually walking down the street and just happened to see someone breaking into the window. However, the detective might have found cigarette ashes and footprints at the scene that indicated that the witness was standing there for a long time. In that case, they would confront the suspect about that and catch them in a lie. And this kind of thing can happen later. An interrogation doesn't have to solve everything in one go. The detective might find more information then come back and confront the suspect. Also, when doing an interrogation, what the suspect does can be just as important as what they say. Body language is a huge indicator of a person's honesty and reliability. If a detective questions a witness and their body language indicates that they're not being entirely honest, the detective might update them to the pool of suspects and have more of a focus on them in the future. 
Aside from crime scene investigations and interviews and interrogations, other ways that a detective can gain information related to a case are through research, personal knowledge or experience, other people with related experience, or by spying on suspects. Consider what resources the detective has available to them, what information they have, and what suspects they have to go on, and decide where to go from there. While you're thinking like a detective in the conduct of your investigations, it's good to keep two maxims in mind from the great detective himself, Sherlock Holmes. Firstly, it is a capital mistake to theorize before one has data. Insensibly, one begins to twist facts to suit theories instead of theories to suit facts. What this means is that the detective should not have a preconceived idea of who committed the crime and why. They should only stick to the facts and base their theories off of the facts, not the other way around. Secondly, whenever you eliminate the impossible, whatever remains, no matter how improbable, must be the truth. In practice, this means the detective should consider the most likely and probable theories first and press those against the facts. If that theory doesn't stack up to the facts, discard that theory and try another one. While the detective is progressing through the investigation, you should also consider what your culprits are doing during the investigation what countermeasures they might be taking, if any, how they might react to upcoming news information, and most importantly, how their actions might affect the investigation. The culprit might, for example, try to flee or make up an alibi or kill a witness that was getting in their way. The culprit's actions could potentially result in another crime and more information and evidence that has to be analyzed and processed. Consider how the detective will react to these new events and how that might alter the course of the investigation, if at all. Twists like these are an important part of keeping the reader's interest throughout the story. But as you're writing all these twists and turns, remember what your end goal is. The detective will have to follow the trail of clues to eventually uncover who, what, where, when, how, and why, find a logical explanation for everything, and confront the suspect with the evidence against them. There is no single right or wrong way for you to do this, but if you can figure out a way to do it, and do it well, then you'll have successfully written a mystery story. Sometimes there's only so much you can do before you have to call it quits. We might have reached the end of my investigation, but I hesitate to put the case close stamp on this file just yet. There's still a lot of leads to follow up on. Any good fiction writer worth their salt should read and read a lot, and when it comes to mystery writing, there are literally hundreds of books out there, both fiction and non-fiction, just waiting for any would-be writer to take inspiration from. I'd written up a list of some of my personal recommendations, books that had been greatly helpful to me in my career. For those who came after, there are plenty more waiting to be discovered. But for now, all I really need is a drink and a good book.